You don't do your material around a lot of comedians. <laughs> that's like standing in front of the police. They sit on the side, ooh, that's funny. Next thing you know, you see it on HBO or something, you be sitting at home, that shit mine, you know? <laughs> but ain't nobody gonna believe you first come, first serve. It changed everything. It changed the, the scope of their friendship. It just, it, it changed everything. Ed Lover has seemed to confirm Cat Williams' claims about Steve Harvey and his difficulties with Bernie Mac. The legendary DJ dropped a new episode of his Come On Son podcast on January 5th, where he backed up Williams' story that the comedian shared on the latest episode of the Club Shay Shay podcast. He Williams goes on to say that he was supposed to be one of the kings of comedy, that they approached him after Bernie passed, he said in the episode. But he didn't want to go on the kings of comedy tour because of Steve Harvey's treatment of Bernie Mac. He has a lot of respect for Bernie Mac. As Ed Lover, and I was on the radio in New York, on Hot 97, I got wind of a cat in Atlanta going by the name of Chris Lover Lover. After explaining that he'd been a friend of Bernie Mac's until the day he died, Ed Lover continued, the stuff that Cat Williams said about Steve Harvey calling to try to get Bernie's role on Ocean's Eleven and that kind of stuff, Bernie told me out of his own mouth. I believe Bernie Mac when he said Steve Harvey hated on him, he concluded. Cat Williams certainly shook the table with his appearance on Club Shay Shay on January 4th, but he saved most of his vitriol for Steve Harvey. The same Steve that went to go watch Mark Curry do his whole sitcom and then stole everything Mark Curry had, he said in the interview. Now Steve got a sitcom where he the principal, and he wear a suit, and then he gets this high top fade, making all black men think he got the best lineup in the business, and it's a man unit, he continued. Then you ask him, why you not a movie star? I didn't want to be a movie star. This the same Negro that hated on Bernie Mac with this same thing. There are 30,000 new scripts in Hollywood every year. Not one of them asked for a country bumpkin black dude that can't talk good and look like Mr. Potato Head. There ain't none. You have to have range. Mean Meanwhile, Bernie's daughter, Janice McCullough, has finally weighed in on Cat Williams' interview. Steering clear of the more controversial remarks that came from the nearly three-hour episode, McCullough instead chose to focus on Williams' expression of praise for her father while calling out comedians, namely Steve Harvey, who allegedly tried to slight Mac before he passed away at the age of 50 in 2008. She said, I don't know Cat Williams, uh, never met him. That's one person I never did get to meet when my dad was alive, but from everything that I've ever Ever heard my dad, you know, say he's always seemed like a stand up dude, so I have no qualms, no quarrels with him. She explained that Williams' praise for her father was proof that the late comedian was a man of integrity. It does my heart good that my dad was a stand-up guy. The man that I knew him to be was who he actually was to people. Cause that's a thing, like, we can love people and think they one way and find out later. McAuliffe continued, I just really appreciate what I believe is genuine love and respect that Cat Williams showed my father. Now this is not the first time that Cat Williams has spoken about the late comedian, Bernie Mac. In a previous interview with Vlad TV, Cat Williams delved deep into the enigmatic life of Bernie Mac, alleging that the Hollywood moguls who reaped massive profits from his success actually harbored a seething hatred for him. I know that the people that made money off Bernie Mac didn't like him. Mm. They hated his guts. Mm. And that was our king. That was our real king. While many perceived Mac as a comedic giant, his journey was far from a fairy tale. Williams' shocking claims hint at a dark conspiracy that paints Bernie Mac as a victim of Hollywood's relentless pursuit of profit, with gatekeepers allegedly cashing in on his talent while treating him with disdain. As Williams peeled back the layers of the story, he suggested that Bernie Mac's ascent and eventual fall might have been orchestrated by unseen hands. The allegations are startling. Apparently, Mac's triumphs were not due to genuine support from the industry, but rather a calculated move to exploit his talents for financial gain. Cat Williams didn't mince his words when he described the clandestine manipulation that might have contributed to Bernie Mac's story ending on a tragic note. What's more, he also talked about how Hollywood elites changed the narrative to fit their own interest. Not how it ended up, because sometimes the victors rewrite history, but by the same token, God is there for us, and sometimes his best gift to us is getting us out. For context, in the year 2000, a comedic extravaganza took center stage, leaving audiences in stitches and cementing its place in the annals of stand-up history. The original Kings of Comedy, directed by the visionary Spike Lee, showcased the uproarious talents of Steve Harvey, D.L. Hewley, Cedric the Entertainer, and Bernie Mac. 
filmed over two unforgettable nights in Charlotte, North Carolina. This comedic masterpiece not only dissected the nuances of African-American culture, race relations, religion, and family, but also left an indelible mark on the world of comedy. At the helm of this laughter-filled journey was none other than the charismatic Steve Harvey, renowned for his role in The Steve Harvey Show. On stage, Harvey shed his sitcom persona and unleashed a torrent of humor laced with a significant amount of profanity. As the master of ceremonies, Harvey received three short sets, each a comedic roller coaster ride through his unique perspective. Harvey's finale set was a masterclass in audience interaction, as he playfully stole a coat from an unsuspecting spectator, all while questioning the unlikely profession of the thuggish looking owner. Delving into his upbringing within the church, Harvey hilariously critiqued the inefficiency of black church building funds and regaled the audience with anecdotes of Sister Odell's comical attempts at hymn singing, interspersed with lyrics from popular television theme songs. Following Harvey's uproarious sets was D.L. Hewley, star of The Hewleys, whose comedic prowess lay in his astute observations on Black American family dynamics, particularly those rooted in the South. Hewley skillfully navigated the disparities between Black and white experiences, humorously asserting that activities like skydiving were off-limits to Black individuals, given the inherent risks they faced in their daily lives. The comedian also introduced the audience to the humorous game of Helicopter Man and shared a rib-tickling tale involving skid-marked undergarments hidden in his laundry. Cedric the Entertainer, Harvey's co-star on The Steve Harvey Show, positioned himself as the comedian most in tune with the younger demographic. His routine revolved around the dichotomy between the hope factor and the wish factor, humorously highlighting the contrasting outlooks of white and black individuals. Cedric, now a grown-ass man, humorously reflected on the transition from image mature behavior to responsible adulthood, all the while refusing to admit to alleged joke theft from Cat Williams. Addressing topics ranging from the hypothetical anger of a black president facing a Monica Lewinsky question to the prospect of black people migrating to the moon, Cedric showcased his versatility. His love for Jamaican music and humorous take on problem solving in their lyrics added an extra layer of entertainment. Bernie Mac, the most autobiographical of the quartet, turned his comedy inward, delivering punchy attacks on himself. His routines touched on his decreased S-drive, preference for quick encounters, an unapologetic approach to child-rearing, where he asserted his willingness to F a kid up if necessary. Mac's extensive routine explored the challenges of raising his fictional sister's children, laying the groundwork for his future hit series, The Bernie Mac Show. A poignant story unfolded as Mac recounted his mentally challenged nephew's struggles with a stuttering bus driver. The set concluded with Mac's exploration of the versatility of the swear word MF, turning it from a noun to an adjective, and even transforming it into a split infinitive. His impact on comedy was unmistakable, and his routines lingered in the minds of audiences long after the laughter subsided. The original Kings of Comedy wasn't just a film, it was a cultural phenomenon that transcended racial boundaries and united audiences in laughter. The success of the film paved the way for numerous spin-offs, showcasing the enduring influence of its four comedic maestros. However, this show also held some deep, dark secrets. For starters, hushed rumors, which have circulated for years, hint that Mac's career might not have reached its full potential due to alleged tensions amongst these comedians. Cedric, who was a part of the tour along with D.L. Hewley, Steve Harvey, and Bernie Mac, confirmed that the two comedians did not see eye to eye. Yeah, yeah, I mean, you know, they were the kind of guys that, they both alpha males, you know, like they both, they just saw it different, you know what I'm saying? But at the end of the day, they was able to get through it, he said while on Shannon Sharp podcast club, Shay Shay. Cedric added that because of the feud, it had prevented them from doing another tour. I think, of course, that was, you know, definitely a contributing circumstance, but I also think that it had a lot to do with the promoter on the thing because he got a bigger head than all of us. The dude that put us all together started to really think was about him, so it started to be that. So it was a lot of those kinds of elements. Is that one of the reasons why you didn't do you did it. You did the first. You did the first part. You did the second part. I, I don't think. I think. Yo, of course, like that was you know definitely a contributing circumstance. In 2003, Mac had an interview with GQ magazine where he accused Harvey of being jealous of him and trying to sabotage him for certain movie roles. Harvey acknowledged his feelings about the GQ article and admitted his anger about it. I was upset at first because it just wasn't true, said Harvey. Me and Bernie had a lot of good times together and then this article in GQ came out and put all this vicious stuff in there. Harvey also acknowledged that he spoke with Mac about the interview. B said he never said it. I had to take him at his word for it. After Mac's passing, Harvey revealed 
revealed that his widow, Rhonda McCullough, helped him get beyond the feud. Rhonda of all people knows the truth. It was a cleansing moment for me because I was able to let go of a lot of stuff. No one knows what was actually behind the beef. However, Harvey's admission of having a cleansing moment might imply that something was there. Indeed. Whatever it was, we'll probably never know. In any case, Bernie began his career as a stand-up comedian in Chicago's Cotton Club. After he won the Miller Lite comedy search at the age of 32, his popularity as a comedian began to grow. In 1992, a performance on the third episode of HBO's Deaf Comedy Jam thrust him into the spotlight. After Martin Lawrence was unable to calm an increasingly hostile crowd, Mac went on stage and told the audience, I ain't scared of you MFs, and that he didn't come here for no foolishness. Mac opened for Dionne Warwick, Red Fox, and Natalie Cole. He played a small role in 1994's House Party 3 as Uncle Vester. He also had a short-lived talk show on HBO titled Midnight Mac. Later, Mac also acted in minor roles, playing Mr. Johnson, the no-nonsense owner of a grill and diner in the movie Baps, and Pastor Clever in Ice Cube's 1995 vehicle Friday. Following that role, Mac was chosen to play the title role in the 1995 Apollo revival of The Wiz. Mac had his first starring role as Dollar Bill. Bill, a silly, slick-talking club owner in 1998's The Players Club. In 2000, he joined fellow comedians in the film The Original Kings of Comedy. After the Kings of Comedy hit the scene, a bunch of fans were like, wait, who's this guy? I mean, we'd seen him in our favorite flicks like Friday, The Players Club, and How to Be a Player. But after Kings of Comedy, Bernie Mac's name was on everyone's lips. In fact, there's a good reason they let him close the show. Nobody could follow that act. So, after the film, everyone started wondering, why hasn't he got his own show yet? I ain't got no television show. Why? Because you scared of me. <laughs> scared I'm going to say something. You see, at the time, Steve and Cedric shared the screen on The Steve Harvey Show, and D.L. Hewley had his own radio show. But Bernie Mac had yet to break through the mainstream, and it's not like people weren't trying to get Bernie Mac on TV. Mac's first attempt in television was hosting an R&B jazz late-night variety show on HBO called Midnight Mac in 1995. The series lasted four episodes. Chris Rock, who cast Mac as his brother in the 2003 comedy Head of State, said that he tried to get Bernie a TV show before he became a household name. A few years ago, I had a meeting with NBC. They asked me, what do I want to do? I said, I want to do a TV show with Bernie Mac. And you know, they were kind of like, ah, gee, I don't know. They wouldn't do it. It seemed obvious to everyone except for TV executives that this comedian needed his own show. Larry Wilmore, who co-created the PJs and would go on to co-create Insecure with Issa Rae, realized the same thing that Chris Rock and everyone else who saw Kings of Comedy did. Bernie Mac was a bona fide star. Wilmore thought that Mac would be the perfect music and star of a TV show he was working on. In a 2018 interview with the Television Academy, Wilmore explained how the show came to be. I saw Kings of Comedy, and I saw Bernie Mac's act of taking care of his sister's kids. And I thought, oh, that's interesting. If I did a show with Bernie where he's taking care of his sister's kids because the mother's on crack, that emotional tug draws me into the show, and I'll accept this premise that I have. According to Larry's interview on the D.L. Hewley show in 2019, he already had the idea to do a TV show without Bernie attached. One of the inspirations in creating the show was a PBS reality show called 1900 House. In that show, they rigged cameras in the home. I wanted to do a show where it felt like we were observing the family rather than the action pushed at us. In that same interview, DL confirmed that Bernie felt that no one would give him an opportunity. He continued by stating that Wilmore was pivotal in the creation of the show because he didn't change Bernie, but he was able to present Bernie in a way that worked for him. Wilmore added that because of his show, The PJs, he knew he wanted to do a non-animated sitcom. So after seeing the original Kings of Comedy, he approached Bernie with the idea, and he loved it. So did Fox. Wilmore's goal was to show a different side of Bernie, which is why he says that the single camera format was so important to the show. Bernie as a comedian on stage is very dynamic. If I had him up in front of an audience, I'd be competing with that version of Bernie, and it'd be no competition. I would lose. But if I were doing a single camera show, I could have a more intimate portrait of Bernie that doesn't compete with the outsized version of him on stage stage, and viewers could get to know him in a different way. The Bernie Mac Show premiered on Fox in November 2001 to decent ratings. The first season averaged 9.5 million viewers, and the show was critically acclaimed. Larry Wilmore won an Emmy Award for writing the pilot episode, and the series won a Peabody Award for the first season as well. That year, Bernie himself was nominated for an Emmy, Golden Globe, and NAACP Image Award for Best Actor in a Comedy Series. After a successful first season, Fox decided to air the show show in direct competition with ABC's My Wife and Kids.
starring Damon Wayans. The Wayans Family sitcom would outperform The Bernie Mac Show on a regular basis. My wife and kids averaged over 11 million viewers to Bernie Mac's 10 million. Yes, the show fell behind my wife and kids, but the second season of The Bernie Mac Show delivered higher ratings than the first season, and for some reason, the network still wasn't satisfied with the show. In that same interview with the Television Academy, Wilmore remembers the night he won the Emmy Award, where the head of Fox said, well, I guess now we can't fire him. Apparently, even before the second season premiered, Larry Wilmore's relationship with the network soured. Wilmore says Fox tried to divide him and Bernie, which proved to be successful by the middle of the second season. In the interview, Larry wonders if it was Bernie's personal demons that might have gotten in the way when it came to who really created the show. Wilmore added that it's possible Bernie may have felt that something was stolen from him. As the relationship between Bernie and Larry worsened, Larry said, after that, there was really no reason for him to stick around, and that's when the network fired him in the middle of the season. Variety reported that Wilmore and the network constantly clashed over the direction of the show, and Fox felt the show wasn't delivering enough laughs. While Wilmore was the showrunner, he constantly received network notes interfering with the creative process. The network notes started right from the beginning. According to Entertainment Weekly, Wilmore revealed that the network didn't like it when Bernie spanked Jordan in the middle of the drugstore in the pilot episode. Larry responded, sorry white people but black people spanked their kids, then proceeded to ignore the note. Eventually, tensions between Wilmore, Bernie, and Fox got to the point of no return, and Fox fired Wilmore halfway through season two. After Wilmore's firing, the network pushed the show's time slot back an hour. The show was no longer competing with my wife and kids, giving it a ratings boost. The Bernie Mac show now followed American Idol, giving it even better ratings than the first season. A 2003 article in TV Guide details Mac's feelings towards Wilmore's firing. You know networks. Similar backstage battles have been going on for a long time, but the situation with Larry was something that he chose to do. Larry was an instrumental part of the Bernie Mac show. He really shaped it, but there really wasn't anything he could do after season two. The Bernie Mac show would last for another three years on Fox, but the ratings would continue to decline due to the constant shuffling of the show's time slot. First, it was on Wednesdays, and they moved the show to Sundays, then Mondays, and back to Wednesdays, before finally settling on Fridays. Fans found it hard to keep up. The final season season of the show averaged 3.6 million viewers. Despite the show's low ratings, the show won three consecutive NAACP Image Awards for Outstanding Comedy Series. Bernie himself would take home four straight NAACP Awards for Outstanding Actor in a Comedy Series. The series aired its final episode on April 14, 2006. Throughout its run, the Bernie Mac show had tugged on the heartstrings of millions of viewers who identified with Bernie in his style of parenting. Yes, the series is based on the comedy of Bernie Mac, but like DL said, Larry was able to present Bernie in a very specific, unique, and digestible format for all Americans to see. In any case, during the final years of his illustrious career, Bernie Mac confronted not just the demands of showbiz, but also a hidden battle with severe sarcoidosis, a perplexing ailment characterized by inflammation in the body's tissues. This revelation marked a poignant turning point in the life of the beloved comedian, as he grappled with the relentless challenges posed by his health while striving to continue his remarkable journey in the world of entertainment. On March 19, 2007, during an appearance on the CBS Late Show with David Letterman, Bernie Mac made an announcement that would reverberate throughout the entertainment industry. With candor and a hint of resignation, he shared his decision to retire from the career that had spanned three decades. He expressed his desire to savor life outside the spotlight, revealing how he yearned to relish the simple joys he had missed along the way. I'm going to still do my producing, my films, Mac told Letterman, but I want to enjoy my life a little bit. In his heartfelt conversation with Letterman, Bernie Mac reflected on his early days as a street performer, recalling a time when he was just a struggling artist honing his craft. I missed a lot of things, you know, he confided to Letterman. I was a street performer for two years. I went into clubs in 1977 and was on the road 47 weeks weeks out of the year. Despite the toll that his extensive career had taken on him, Bernie Mac remained a formidable presence in the film industry during these final years. He etched his name in cinematic history with a memorable appearance in the 2007 blockbuster Transformers, where he portrayed the charismatic car salesman Bobby Bolivia. Additionally, his distinctive voice graced the animated world as he lent his talents to the character of Zuba, Alex the Lion's long-lost father, in Madagascar, Escape to Africa. Notably, Bernie Mac's 
Rock's last two film endeavors, Soul Men, a musical comedy where he co-starred alongside Samuel L. Jackson and Old Dogs, in which he played the role of Jimmy Lunchbox, continued to captivate audiences months after his passing. Tragically, on July 19, 2008, Bernie Mac's health took a sharp decline, necessitating his admission to Northwestern Memorial Hospital in his beloved hometown of Chicago. For three grueling weeks, he battled the complications in the intensive care unit. However, in the early morning hours of August 9, 2008, Bernie Mac succumbed to a cardiac arrest, leaving a void in the world of comedy and entertainment. Following his tragic demise, many comedians spoke up about all the struggles that Bernie Mac had faced in the industry. And one of these comedians who spoke up was Reginald Ballard. According to Ballard, Bernie was also being overworked by Hollywood. Well, you had said that you felt like they worked him to death because yeah. he was doing Ocean's Eleven at the time. I believe so, man. Reginald Ballard, who shared the screen with Bernie Mac in the star-studded ensemble of Ocean's Eleven, spoke candidly about the toll that Hollywood's relentless demands took on the beloved comedian. Ballard recounted that during the production of Ocean's Eleven, Bernie Mac confided in his fellow cast members about the exhaustive schedule he was enduring. He told us that he was doing so much, Ballard revealed. When Brad Pitt broke his ankle and production had to be delayed, it cut into Bernie's time for other projects, like Guess Who? He had to rush and try to do a lot of stuff, and he felt that they didn't understand that it wasn't his fault. They put him in a, you know, compromising position that he really didn't want to be in. This revelation sheds light on the grueling pace at which Bernie Mac was forced to operate, juggling multiple film projects and promotional commitments back to back. The pressures of maintaining a demanding work schedule while navigating health issues began to take a toll on the comedian's well-being. Ballard further disclosed that Bernie Mac's health was a constant concern during the filming of Ocean's Eleven. The actor had been hospitalized prior to shooting due to health complications and was taking medications, including prednisone, which caused noticeable changes in his appearance. You know we used to do a scene and he had to go upstairs to his dressing room to get oxygen, Ballard recalled. He'd come back and do the scene again. He was basically working while he was sick. Additionally, there were speculations that Bernie was overworking himself so as to prove his value in the industry. In any case, despite all the hardships he faced, Bernie Mac still remains a legend to all the fans he left behind. Anyway, that's it for this video, folks. Bye.